So Taya, we don't have Sherry. Hopefully Sherry's gonna jump in, but if not, you're gonna get the anti-oppression um, decolonizing question. So be ready. I know you already have a great answer for it. She will. She's got it. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Doubling Down. We will be getting started a few minutes after four o'clock. We're so excited to have you all. We're up at 38 participants right now, including our range of speakers. We have speakers who are students as well as organizers for our different programs, and they're great. Um, I see Jorge, who in the Vancouver uh, Public Library is here. So that's my first shout out. I love watching people stream in and giving them shout outs. I also love to just find out a little bit about who's in the room with us. And I love seeing uh, some couple warm up questions as we're just all hanging out here, warming up our, our Zoom fingers, stretching in front of the camera. So I've been asking all of our speakers, what has been their go to pandemic comfort food? So I'm gonna ask the same of all of you. Go ahead and type that into the chat. Right now we've discovered among our speakers, we have a very strong um, Oreo fan club. That has been a big one. Quesadillas, nice, I love it. Uh, yeah, and ice cream was the other one. And pizza, we also have heard about a um, go-to shawarma uh, event or shawarma place in the States, which is good. Tacos all the time. Ooh, we're getting that sort of like, we've got, we got the Oreo club. So we got the sweets versus the savory folks in the room today. That's gonna be awesome. You can see it's already having some, some COVID tensions on Zoom. So it's good. So if you're just rolling in, we're up to 45 folks now. We're probably, we had a registration of 170. So I'm hoping we're gonna break hundred, which will be great. Carry it, Thai, yes, Thai food is great. Um, we're gonna get started in just a few minutes. You should see a poll if you haven't already answered it. We'd like to get a sense of who is in the room. And we're getting a sense of just getting to know each other now with the question of what has been your go-to pandemic comfort food. So pick the thing on the, on the um, poll that best describes you. It might not be perfect, uh, but you know, whatever you kind of want to show up as today. People have been eating a lot of cereal during the pandemic, uh, a lot of junk food. I've started to get over the junk food. I've started to get back into the cooking. A lot of homemade soups are now my go-to, uh, which has been good. The other thing I love to hear, we actually, from our speakers, have four different time zones represented. We have someone who is with us right now from China, and it's 7 a.m. there, right? Yes, Leo. We also have folks who are from Chicago and the East Coast. So we have four different time zones here. We're based out of Vancouver. So my next question for all of you is gonna be just, where are you? Where are you coming from? Where are you logging into today? We know it's it's four o'clock in Vancouver and the sun is shining. So I appreciate that you've all have decided to come indoors and join us on Zoom. And then for those who are at seven o'clock in the, in the East Coast, thank you, it's after dinner. Uh, it's great to have you. Estelle, hello, welcome. Estelle in Edmonton, my second shout out. So much fun. West End, Vancouver, Surrey, Vancouver, lots of folks in the lower mainland. So a lot of these are, are cities in Vancouver or around Vancouver in British Columbia, City Hall area, which is great. We really wanted to showcase a bunch of ideas that we can then activate here in British Columbia. So we do have so many speakers from different projects around that. Uh, Chicago, Kitsilano is another neighborhood around Vancouver, which is great. And those things. And White Rock, excellent. And those things. So yeah, if, you, if you're just rolling in, we'll be getting started in just another minute or so. I'm just gonna let a few more people roll in. We've been sharing our favorite pandemic comfort foods in the chat. We have a war going on between Oreos and you know, Mexican food, I think. There's definitely factions happening, uh, which is good to know. So go ahead and type into the chat what your favorite pandemic comfort food is so we can sort out who's who in the room. And also where you're coming from. Where are you today? We do have speakers in four different time zones today. So we'd love to see uh, where you're at as well. Is it morning where you are? Is it eat after dinner or an afternoon like it is in Vancouver? Ooh, Ben and Jerry's half baked. Yes, there's also the ice cream club is well represented today. Also be sure to check out our poll so that you know um, who's in the room related to education and stuff like that. Peace between foods, sorry. I, I like to antagonize a little bit, it warms us up. <laughs> But Hassan has reminded me that dialogue is about um, learning together, co-development and uh, going on. All right, so 
let's get started as we go. A few more people are going to continue to roll in. We've, we've topped the 60 mark. Welcome to all of you who've arrived late. You have made it to the right event. This is doubling down. Uh, we've just been warming up the room a little bit, but now we're going to get started. So let's see who is in the room with us. You should see the poll, right? Can folks see this poll? Now? So we have about a quarter of us are teachers or students. We have several school administrators. We did love to have administrators in the room. We have a couple parents, parent advisory councils, parent teacher associations do make the world go round. It's one of the best places to learn about democracy in action, as well as several members who are probably alum, student alumni and general folks in the public. So those in the public, I am gonna give you a homework assignment. This is education after all. You folks, since you're not directly related to education, I am gonna ask you to have a conversation, share something about this event with an educator in your life. So spread the word uh, while you're here today. Uh, so that, great. And to kick us off, we have a bit of housekeeping as always. Uh, there, Renee is my lovely tech host behind the scenes. So she's gonna do what she needs to do to make this poll disappear, happen or whatever, because I think I did it wrong, but that's just fine. I'm gonna move on to our housekeeping. So. We want to promise today, because we are in the middle of a pandemic, and we recognize that teachers and administrators have had far more than their fair share of duties this time. So we want you to sit back and relax and not have to think too hard as we celebrate some solutions together. So we are going to record this event, so don't feel like you're going to miss something. Don't feel like you've got to you know, rush to take some notes. Just relax and help us celebrate. Also, if you need closed captioning, I do speak very fast, I know that. Uh, you look in your settings and there is a setting to turn on closed captioning. Just look for, the, um, for that. And we do have folks monitoring the chat. So if you need some help to find it, go ahead and ask in the chat and they will help direct it to you. We also know that we're all a little tired and cranky now. You know, it's a year into the pandemic. So we do ask you to show up with kindness and forgiveness in the chat and with our speakers. We will be monitoring for that. And really, we want you to just have a smile today and to learn about some solutions. Because doubling down is about excitement. It's about energy. It's embedded in that phrase. The phrase, if you didn't know, actually comes from the word in the game of blackjack. And it's when you receive by chance two identical cards. You then have the option to double your bet, your bet and play two cards, giving you the chance to win twice. It's a moment of opportunity, of risk, excitement, and ultimately action. You have to decide to double down. Will you renew your commitment? Take a little risk? All for the possibility of an even bigger win. We hope so, and we wanna bring that energy to each of you for all of our topics in the series, starting today with civic education. And so we wanted to share with you four programs that make us smile. We're joined by City High, which is a youth-led organization in Vancouver. And they're going to share a knowledge to action pedagogy. We're also joined by the Canadian Ethics Bowl, Civics Control F curriculum, which helps address misinformation. And we have several folks from participatory budgeting, and especially the UIC Neighborhood Initiative in Chicago, which is great. If you have been to other events hosted by the Morris J. Waugh Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University, you know we usually like to take a question and unpack it. We like to go deep and find meaning together. I wanna to warn you that this event is very different. It's more of an informative sharing than co-generative. Think of this as a teaser info session. It's just a taste to get your creative juices flowing and your motivations recharging. And don't worry if you miss something. We're gonna be sending an email after the event with links to information provided by each of our programs. And that will actually can do some step-by-step -step of how can you activate some of these programs. And although we focus on dialogue and engagement at the Morris J. Waugh Center for Dialogue here in Vancouver, we do like to say that everything we do is related to democracy. So my name is Jennifer Wallowick, and I'm the project manager for Strengthening Canadian Democracy Initiative. The initiative works to strengthen democratic culture outside of the political arena. And we need a strong culture if we want to improve our institutions. And you know what? Education is something that creates culture. And since this is a panel on education, I really wanted to model the importance of creating learning opportunities. I learned from my elders the importance of learning while doing. And now that I'm older, I like to create these opportunities for others. Thus, I am delighted to share in hosting duties today with Adele Siume, 
one of our SFU Semester in Dialogue graduates who has led the organizing of this event. She's met with all of our speakers, she's met with all of our students, and she's really helped craft this event and had my back throughout. And I'm also gonna let you all in on a secret. This is Adele's first opportunity to host such a public gathering of this size, and I know you will all be kind. So Adele, I'm gonna pass it on to you to introduce yourself and let you lead us in land acknowledgement so we can begin our session in a good way. Over to you, Adele. Thanks so much, Jen. That was an awesome introduction. Um, so yes, my name is Adele Seum, and I am a Dialogue and Research Engagement Assistant with the Strengthening Democracy Team at the Center of Dialogue. And I am so honored to be able to present such incredible programs and speakers today. Our panelists provide a wide range of geographical perspectives and intersectional positions, and we know that they'll make for a really rich and informative event. That being said, we acknowledge that our speakers are not a reflection of the full diversity of experiences and leadership in our education programs. To name this, we will be asking each program to share how they are contributing to the work that we all need to do to further anti-oppression and decolonization. That being said, this leads me to my land acknowledgement. So to those of you who don't know, this is a practice done in Canada to honor the indigenous communities that this land belongs to. I currently live in the Coast Salish territories, more specifically on the stolen land of the Musqueam, Salatooth, and Squamish peoples that we now call Vancouver. We do this practice because we realize that colonization is not a thing of the past but as an ongoing reality. Uh, Canada has a 150 year legacy of residential schools. Residential schools are one of the many tools used to oppress indigenous peoples and miseducate all Canadians. Over 150,000 indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families and sent through these traumatizing institutions. And thousands of these children did not survive. We have only really begun to really begun to scratch the surface of the legacy of this trauma. And we have a long way to go to understand its impacts. But although education was used as a powerful colonial tool, it also holds the key to reconciliation. So we will continue to innovate education. And I am so grateful that you are joining us for this process. So, what are we gonna be doing together today? On the agenda, we will first be finding out key info from each group. Um, so we really wanna make sure to prioritize these students. Um, so they get to speak first, yeah. Um, and they will share why they loved the program and how it helped them engage with their civic process and their civic um, communities. Then the organizers will explain how the program works and the the steps to initiate it in more detail. So more of the logistical side of things. Then each group will be broken up into different breakout rooms. And you, the attendees, will be able to choose which room you want to go into. So it will be, there will be a knowledge to action room, an ethics bowl room, a control F room, and a participatory budgeting room. We'll get a little taste of each event, but or of each program, but you get to choose what you really wanna dive into and learn more about in the breakout room and ask more questions. So um, we will then, um, about 20 minutes in the breakout rooms and then we will end up coming back to the main plenary here together. And we have an exciting surprise with us today. We have Kristen joining us from Drawing for Change. I don't know if you guys can see her, but Kristen, if you wanna give us a wave or I'm not sure if she's able to do that. You might just be seeing She's waving, name. she's waving. Oh, she's waving right there. Look at that, great. Um, so Kristen will be here and she's gonna be able to fly on the wall as our speakers present and you ask questions and she'll be personifying our dialogue into graphic art. And at the end, she'll present our collective artwork. Super cool, I know. Um, but now that being said, let's get started with our first speaker. So I will start us off by introducing um, Hassan Morali, representing Knowledge to Action. Hassan is a Capilano University student, a community advocate, and an active citizen. He is passionate about civic engagement, public dialogue, and education in all forms, 
and he's also a former participant and mentor of City Hive's North Shore Young Citizens Forum. Hassan, how has your participation in City Hive impacted you? I'll let you take it away. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I've been an attendee at Center for Public Dialogue events for a long time, so it's an honor to be invited to speak at one. Um, and I just like to say that I'm calling in uh, from what's colonially known as North Vancouver, but what are the stolen lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations. <clears throat> so I was a part of the North Shore Young Citizens Forum, which gathered young people aged 18 to 39 that live, work, or play in the North Shore region of Vancouver, who are interested in getting more engaged with their local government. Uh, it gathered people with varying levels of civic knowledge and taught them about the workings of municipal government, connected them with city staff and city councilors, and guided us through a presentation to city council. I was first a participant in the spring of 2019, and then, which was in person, pre-pandemic, and then as an alumni mentor in the virtual cohort uh, this past fall in 2020. Uh, like, I love this program for a lot of reasons. Um, it connected me to other young people with similar interests in my area. It gave me a chance to get more involved in my community. And most importantly, it gave me experience. <clears throat> this is the most critical part for me. It gave me experience actually doing activities that constitute civic engagement. Through the program, I got to meet members of city council and municipal staff and hear from people who already did activities that are considered civic engagement like presenting to city council, for example. This guided activity showed me and other people my age how to be an active citizen by actually being active citizens. So when I went through the program as a participant, I was already pretty engaged and knowledgeable about different types of politics and levels of government, uh, but not very engaged or knowledgeable about municipal politics in the place where I've spent most of my life. Um, I joined because I love civic engagement and I'm always looking to get more involved. Uh, but there were others there who weren't that involved or knowledgeable about politics of any kind. And I was so surprised and elated to see the transformation of other people who were disengaged, but curious to engaged and knowledgeable about how to uh, engage with their community and their local government. Um, this program gave me the confidence and I'm somebody who's, you know, through student politics and just being an active citizen, I've lobbied uh, federal and provincial politicians. Um, you know, so I'm no stranger to talking to people in government. Uh, but this program boosted even my confidence uh, to be able to engage with people who are my local elected officials. Because um, throughout it all, the core of the program was at the core of the program was one question that represents. Uh, you know, the application of the knowledge to action framework, which is why don't people in our age cohort engage with their municipalities, um, you know, and throughout the program, as we were talking to city councilors, city staff, each other, uh, you know, guest speakers, we kept answering, asking and answering this question. And by the end of it, not only did we understand the reasons why young people don't engage with their municipalities, but we removed those reasons for ourselves. Um, so, and, you know, classic civic education where we look at a chart with various levels of government uh, is one of the areas of education where the learning is still mostly theoretical. If you're teaching, and this doesn't make sense, if you're, because if you were teaching somebody to play basketball, you wouldn't show them the mechanics of a jump shot and then throw them in a game. You expect them to practice first. And, you know, what good is someone practicing for the first time without anyone there to guide them or give them tips and pointers or most importantly, coach them through the process. Uh, you know, not everyone learns the same way. And even for the people like myself who love theory and reading and academic discussion, everyone benefits, uh, I believe, from, you know, this iterative process of learning by doing. Um, so to sum up, I mean, the North Shore Young Citizens Forum has had a huge impact on uh, my ability to engage civically. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of people that I went through the program with. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed it so much that I came back as an alumni mentor to help other people who are nervous or, you know, unsure or not knowledgeable about getting involved in their community uh, to help them the way that the North Korean Citizens Forum helped me. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Hassan. Um, yeah, that was a phenomenal analogy. I mean, because really, why do we have to make it so difficult to, and you know, and just in really, um, uh, yeah, it's just a really great way to, to explain that. So thank you so much. And um, we will move on to learn more about the ethics bowl. And we have two students with us today, um, one of which is based here in Vancouver. And um, our, our other student is actually based in China. Uh, so we have Amia Duan, who is currently a grade 12 student attending um, Ideal Mini School at Sir Winston Secondary. She has participated in the Regional Ethics Bowl since 2019 and has proceeded to the National Ethics Bowl for the past three years with her team. Impressive. And we have Liu, uh, Liu Huang, who is a high school senior in Shanghai and is the founding director of the Ethics Bowl China. Over the past three years, his efforts led to the expansion of the Ethics Bowl program across the country, gaining significant influence among high school students nationwide. Super impressive. So Amea, if you would mind uh, starting us off, that'd be awesome. Alrighty. Um, hi everyone, my name is Amea. So um, like Adele said, I have been participating in the Ethics Bowl in Canada for the past three years and it has taught me a lot. So um, Ethics Bowl is it's kind of like a competition. It's very similar to debate. However, ethics is a lot more discussion based than arguing points. And it's okay for both teams to have the same viewpoint as long as they have things to add to the discussion. And the ethics bowl is also time, just like a debate. So the ethics bowl has taught me personally a lot and a lot of the people that I have worked with as well. So, I'm responsible for ensuring that I'm knowledgeable in all the cases that we participate in. And I need to know of the points that we will talk about as well. So just like life how and how it isn't all black and white, um, the same thing is a lot like uh, the cases that we talk about in Ethics Bowl. So because of Ethics Bowl, I have come to appreciate and respect the viewpoints of others while still being able to objectively analyze them. And it's made me more confident in my ability to defend my opinions and become a better speaker in general. I've also learned how to take the emotions out of discussion and defend it based on facts. And I've improved not only my discussion skills, but also um, collaboration abilities. And in Ethics Bowl, you have to work with a lot of different personalities and that can be tough. However, ethics has taught me that it's okay to collaborate with a lot of different people and you sometimes have to do that. And um, I've also had to take a leadership role um, in ethics bowl as a competition, I guess, as well as in my school's club. And this is just making sure that I ensure teamwork is achieved and all voices are heard. So in general, um, it just helps students around the community. At my school, I can see that students have gained confidence and they've developed analytical and cross-examination skills. And they've also um, been encouraged to formulate their own thoughts and opinions in a respectful and clear manner quickly, even if it doesn't go with what the general group is saying. And um, I think that's it, thank you. Thank you, Maya, that was awesome. And Leo, if you wouldn't mind, um, carrying on and teaching us a little bit more about the Ethics Bowl and your experience in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. um, thanks Adele and um, thank you Amaya and thanks to the uh, organizers at SFU for having me. So um, we introduced the Ethics Bowl to Shanghai three years ago and um, over the past years as the director I uh, came to realize that what we sort of introduced is not just um, a new discussion format, but um, there's also a whole set of values that is introduced and uh, which, which involves issues like how we would view uh, disagreements, how we would treat um, the study of ethics itself and how we understand the community. So um, 
um, first about this agreement. So uh, one thing I found particularly interesting while observing some of our coaching sessions is that many students uh, tend to take either a wholly defensive or a wholly attacking attitude when they first came to agreement. Um, but gradually after these sessions, we started to hear um, acknowledgments of how uh, you know, someone else could have correctly pointed out a logical fallacy of mine or um, how I really could have you know, just neglected a, a significant moral dimension in the issue, et cetera. And I think these confessions are um, definitely not just uh, rhetorical techniques, but they're actually, uh, they're pretty frank actually. And um, in addition to, uh, I think simply being aware of the truthfulness of other people's arguments, um, they also start to realize many concerns that sort of motivate those arguments and they're, and just understand why why somebody else is holding that position. And it could be because of differences in personal values, cultural background, family background, religious beliefs, gender, et cetera. And um, this sort of ties us to the um, my second point at how people uh, could change their views on ethics itself. So because of these diverse backgrounds of us, um, at the beginning, many of um, our participants um, would more or less hold a somewhat relativist view on ethics that um, that just says that, well, simply anything goes. Like you have your views and I have mine. And let's just move on. So um, I think th this kind of relativist view is largely the consequence of thinking about ethics, ethics or ethical truths as something that's that must be universal or abstract or uh, like high up in the sky, which there could be none, but it really need not to be like that. So um, if you have your views and I have mine, as a matter of fact, we could still reason and argue in a fairly productive and constructive way. And that is what we all have been doing in the Essex way. So uh, for me, I think the realization that there is uh, sort of no universal verdict that applies to every situation or person uh, doesn't need to result in a rejection of ethical discussion, but it what it really teaches us is that ethics is a kind of practice that needs to be uh, forever continued, uh, not for reaching a universal consensus, but to sort of bridge the gaps and differences among us to the best we can. So uh, that leads us to the final point about community building in the ethics book. So in our last, last ethics book season, which was during the pandemic, uh, we happen to have a team from Wuhan participating online. So in our, one of our Zoom free chat sessions, we had the chance to hear a lot of stories from these Wuhan students. Um, I mean, certainly uh, Wuhan is like in the global spotlight during the pandemic, but um, hearing from the citizens and students there personally, I think is entirely different from like reading the news. And that's exactly what the Essex book can do. Um, it's as simple as giving each other, uh, each of us an opportunity to just to get to know each other personally while leaving aside all the conflicts or stereotypes that we might have for each other. And uh, personally, I think the ES Expo is so well, well qualified to do this uh, because what it teaches students is exactly how we would cope with, uh, you know, complex ethical dilemmas and diversity in our opinions. Yeah, so um, to conclude, I really hope the Essex book could uh, continue its positive influence in our communities and um, potentially make some big difference in the future. Thank you. I've done Zoom so much, I was still muted when I started to talk. But thank you, Leo, for sharing about how really it sounds like this ethics poll. Uh, which we're going to learn about more from the organizers in our next round of conversation. Uh, really is a place, another place where we get this practice, how to practice, how to disagree or to come together to collaborate, which is great. And so now we're going to shift over to Civics Control F program and its curriculum. And we are joined by Athena, a grade 10 student in a high school in Toronto called East York Collegiate Institute. And she, I'm so excited, accepted this um, opportunity or accepted our invitation as an opportunity to reach out beyond her comfort zone and to practice her public speaking. So Athena, I'm delighted to, um, to meet you and to have you share a little bit about why Control F matters. 
All right, so first I wanna talk about what Control F is. It's a program that focuses on teaching skills to investigate information to figure out its credibility. Uh, during my time with Control F, the biggest thing that I learned and I still remember is that there will always be information pollution wherever you are. And you know, if you apply the skills that you learn, you can definitely get around that. With technology in the 21st century, most, if not all of our information comes off the internet or social media. I know mine does. So um, although it's like very convenient, social media and even stuff on the internet makes it super easy um, to be manipulated or for even people to put false information out there. So knowing about information pollution will allow you to like think further and see if it's like really valuable to figure out if it's true or not. Um, something that helped me in getting the right info was checking sources and checking claims, uh, which is something the program taught me is super important. And eventually at some point, everyone will come across mis or disinformation. Misinformation is basically just false information that someone thought was true and so they spread it around where disinformation is also false, but it was purpose, purposely spread by someone or created to create harm or confuse others. Um, when I first learned about disinformation, I was like kind of surprised that people would take the time to create something fake and make it spread everywhere just to harm someone. Um, one of the things I liked about Control F was that it had activities to do and that really helped me engage in the program. But it also made what I learned kind of stick in my head instead of it going one ear and like out the other. Um, oh, the Control F activities did consist of checking the source, checking a claim, and then tracing where the information originally came from. Um, although those were fun, the best was we were given pictures we were given pictures and we had to guess if they were real or fake. And at first I was like, okay, this is gonna be super easy. You know, it's just a picture, how hard could it be? Um, but as soon as we started and I started getting them wrong, I was like, wow. So it made it like really hard to tell if they were real or fake. And it kind of made me realize like you can't always trust your eyes with pictures and you need to like, go back and possibly like look up anything. Um, I did have to do this for school. Uh, even though it was for school though, I did have like really fun, a lot of fun. And I think like, if you're interested in it, you should do it and yeah. Awesome, Athena. I think everyone agreed that you were a fantastic public speaker. I'm so glad you reached out of your uh, comfort zone to join us on this. I love also that we we have put together a panel that's really is talking about very different solutions to, to problems that we're all talking about right now, whether it's polarization, uh, lack of engagement, misinformation. And then now to wrap up our student stories, I'm gonna pass the mic over to participatory budgeting where Jose Navarro will share his story. And then in the breakouts, uh, another student, uh, Samantha Marquez, is going to join us and share her story. So just because we're a little short on time, I'm going to give Samantha the spotlight in our Q&A a bit later. Both are from Curie High School in Chicago, Illinois. Jose is a ninth grade student, and Samantha is an IB sophomore. They both love being a part of social change. Jose, to wrap up our student stories, can you share a bit more about participatory budgeting? Tell us what it is and why it matters. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, actually. Um, we've been working with participatory budget uh, for several years, but it was mainly done by a fundraiser. Like the school would uh, do a fundraiser and they would get the money and they would work with it. But this year we were actually given a grant. Like we were given three, three thousand dollars actually. We we're given three thousand dollars, and we were thinking of how we could spend it wisely. And then, um. We decided to create a survey actually and then the survey was targeting 3,000 students about 3,000 students and we're like okay how do we make how do we make this understandable direct and a democracy so then that's when the idea of the survey came in and we thought it was too much work but then we're like oh it's also targeting all the students like we get to hear the voices from all of them um, for most of them, some were like, okay, I don't want to fill it out. But most of them, we receive a plenty of 
um, responses by now. And actually, the main one. No, they. I'm just asking. Um, Jose, you had a little sound problem glitch there, but we're all good now. You were talking about the results from the survey. Yeah, uh, and from the results, um, the majority decided that they wanted uh, um, those 3,000 to be spent on counseling, like getting more counseling and to be focused on their mental health. And then, yeah, like that was the main that was targeting and we were thinking of how it should, like in the survey we included that we included questions such as like, oh, what is something that you would like to see at Curie, which is a school that you have not yet seen in the past year? What is something that you want the most attention to now? Then I uh, you know, like, oh, we took those questions and then and we also come up with um, is this like who's like oh really think of what we need there are some choices for them we have hello and there was also things in which they could um, there was also box in which they could include something like um something that SDC did include student risk committee and it's actually about in student risk committee it's actually about 12 to 15 of us and we're like okay we could take we could us we could decide like we could do that like all of us we could just decide and be like oh okay the three thousand are going to be spent on this but then again we decided to make it a democracy and honestly it's such an amazing um an amazing project participatory budget will actually most likely be spent on students mental health and which is a great investment and then it's actually it has actually helped us to be more of a community during COVID. Like it has uh, helped us become together and understand one another's um, needs. And then, yeah. and we, we're not also hearing from students. We're also asking adults to step because not only have the students been impacted by this, but also the staff and they're part of the school, the school environments. And so we thought of things that um, could help the school and then make um, the environment more um, more comfortable for all students because like I mentioned again it's not a few of us it's like about 3,000 so we're like it cannot be it cannot be waste on something that is not useful such as oh let's buy t-shirts for all of them oh let's buy hoodies for all of them because like we thought about that and it's like no it's basically one dollar per student so we're like no it's not gonna work we're not gonna invest in that. And then we decided to make it up a democracy. And, oh yeah, and representing 3,000 students is just, has been a long way to get there, has been really hard, really hard, a long way. And it's just something that we, we as a, as a community have wanted to work with. And yeah, we have been able to handle with it. And yeah, with that, I close it. Thank you. Awesome, Jose. I'm going to pass it on to Adele in just a second, but I really wanted to thank like the importance of participatory budgeting, which is really, as you have said, like you get to learn how hard it is to represent 3,000 interests and then make those decisions. So thank you for talking about how it helped you build community in COVID as well. Uh, Adele, why don't you move us on over to our organizers who can really kind of unpack what each one of these programs are now that we've heard why they matter. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, thank you to all the students for all of those great testimonies. That was awesome, guys. Um, so we will start off back to knowledge to action. Um, and so we have Rowan here with us today um who will be representing um city hive so rowan is excuse me my apologies so rowan um gentleman sylvester is the civic education program coordinator for city hive she is passionate about experimental education civic engagement dialogue and democracy in action rowan is also a member of the iap2 canada's young professionals network Rowan, can you please tell us some more about Knowledge to Action? Absolutely, thank you so much, Adele. 
Um, and yes, hi everyone, my name is Rowan. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm the Civic Education Program Coordinator for City Hive. And I just also wanted to acknowledge um, that I am joining this call today from the traditional ancestral and stolen lands of the Musqueam, Skohomish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, um, similar to Hassan as um, joining in what many of us call North Vancouver. Um, so I'm here on behalf of City Hive. And for those of you who don't know, we are a Metro Vancouver-based not-for-profit organization on a mission to transform the way that young people are involved in shaping their cities. So whether that's through decision making, city planning, or urban sustainability issues. And a part of why we're all here is that, um, for those of you who are in BC at least, we know that there's a very large gap in our education system, our K-12 education curriculum, when it comes to teaching civics. How do we engage with our local institutions? Um, and so that's a big part of our work at City Hive and the program area that, that I work in. And so alongside that kind of knowledge gap that we have um, is this lack of opportunities to directly flex that civic engagement muscle. So youth aren't just learning about civics, but they're also not practicing that skill and having that opportunity to engage. So in our programs, um, we work to build those skills and they're not just civic engagement skills, they're relationship building, they're collaborating. It's, you know, um, you know personal agency and civic agency. Uh, and so all of these intertwined skills are one of the pieces that we really want to ensure that people leaving our programs walk away with. So we use this framework that has been mentioned a few times uh, today already called knowledge to action. Um, before I get into the specifics of it, I just really want to give a quick nod. The original knowledge to action framework is actually from a health education and health research context, um, originally defined by Ian Graham in 2006. Not going to go down that whole rabbit hole, but I did want to nod kind of the original um, phrase is often used in that context. Ours is similar but not the same. So we do have our own unique interpretation. Uh, so I'll be sharing that unique interpretation with you today. Um, so in our context at City Hive, we have programs that have two key components, the knowledge and the action. And so the first half of our programs will spend time digging into the content. How do cities work? If the program has a theme like public space or resilience or social isolation, it'll be exploring how do cities work through that theme. And the way we do that is that we invite people who work in that space to come directly work with the participants in the program. So that could be elected officials, that could be city staff, um, that could be community organizers and activists, and they share their expertise from the work that they do with the participants. From there, we shift gears about halfway through the program and we move into projects. So the participants themselves have learned about the complexities of the issue, they've learned about how their local community operates and how decisions are made, and they've probably identified some gaps and some challenges that they come up against, and so they develop projects that address those gaps. These are youth-led, youth-driven projects. Um, it can be recommendations, it could be the starting of a social enterprise. It really could take a lot of different shapes depending on the program. Um, and they're supported beyond the end of the program in making those a reality and advocating for them if they want to. But even if that just ends at the end of the program, they walk away, they never look back at that project, they have gone through the process of realizing that there's an issue, developing a solution, and making that solution happen, all in the course of this one program. So we've built their capacity. So it's really about exploring capacity building, skill building, actually flexing that civic engagement muscle. And it brings together all of these other concepts of experiential education, participatory democracy, community embedded learning. Um, and it's definitely not hard to bring to all kinds of classrooms and many programs already are, I'm sure. Um, but it's about starting with the foundations, making sure everyone understands the issues, the complexities, the perspectives, and then providing an opportunity to flex that muscle and actually try it out. So excited to go deeper in our breakout room, um, but that's our little taster for today on our knowledge to action framework. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that, Rowan. Um, I gotta say, it's it's really exciting to hear that you are exercising these civic um, these civic engagement muscles and and the fact that these students have that opportunity and really allows them to be active citizens and become really powerful leaders as well. So I really appreciate that. Thank you for explaining. Um, and so now we will go back to the ethics bowl. And so we have with us today Dr. Nicholas Filian who is a professor of philosophy at Simon Fraser University. And his research is primarily uh, 
set up or is primarily <laughs> um, within logic and philosophy of science. He's also the lead organizer of the British Columbia Ethics Bowl and on the steering committee of the Canadian Ethics Bowl Consortium. Nick, what else can you tell us about the Ethics Bowl? A lot of things. <clears throat> so the first, thank you for organizing this event. And yeah, as the organizer, I was told you have to cover the boring part of the project, the technicalities. And I thought that's easy. I teach formal logic. Uh, I'm used to that. Um, but um, I mean, Amea and Leo have already expressed why the Ethics Bowl is such a, a great event. And the event's really catching fire since it was introduced in Canada in 2015 by Estelle Lamoureux, who is somewhere uh, uh, in the audience. Uh, it's been growing. Uh, now, it's, now it's taking place uh, um, in Manitoba, in British Columbia, in Alberta, in Ontario. And we're working with people across the country to, to bring it everywhere. Uh, it's also starting in China, in Ireland. It already exists in the United States. There are thousands and thousands of students taking part in the event. Uh, in British Columbia, we're now working with about 12, 13 schools, uh, and we intend to uh, grow it further. If you would be interested in taking part in the event, you just contact me, and I'll make sure that everything um, is done properly. Uh, now, you might be wondering, how, how expensive is it to take part in such a wonderful event? And so far, we've been basically doing it for free. So uh, uh, there, there might be very small costs in the future as we grow, but for now, uh, it, it's very easy. You just get in touch with me and we'll get things started. Uh, so you can write to me anytime. Uh, events start to take place in the fall. Uh, and then we build up the training of all the participants. We start preparing uh, the cases. We explain to participants how to uh, uh, prepare for the event. And then we organize a regional competition in uh, uh, early uh, spring semester, uh, normally in February. We bring well, in non-pandemic time, we bring all the students to Burnaby Mountain uh, so that they can enjoy the beautiful view that we have, uh, have a, a, a nice uh, visit on the university campus, which is often the first time for students taking part in the events. Uh, and then we even feed them pizza and other unhealthy things to make sure that their brains are, are working well for, for the debates. Uh, and then the uh, uh, teams that um, uh, win the event and, and, and second place advance to the national, uh, um, and MAA has done it three times out of three, so that's a pretty good uh, batting average. Uh, and they go to Winnipeg, where the uh, national final is held at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and it's, it's a very great experience. Okay. So let me just tell you a little bit more about the event. So the idea is that uh, the Ethics Bowl differs from other debate competition in that we're not encouraging participants to just butt heads and uh, clash arguments in a purely confrontational manner. Rather, we're trying to encourage them to work with each other and also to develop not just the logic part of critical thinking, but also the attitudes that are associated with having a constructive debate. Um, so teams can agree on things, they don't have to disagree, but the importance is that we uh, get a better understanding of the things that are at stake in those difficult debates. So um, how many students do you need to get started, to get involved? Well, any group of uh, three to seven students can form a team. Uh, there can be more than one team per school. So if multiple teachers would like to assemble a school, that's great. 
Uh, many schools um, uh, form teams from a philosophy club or an ethics club or a debate club. Uh, and some other teachers actually use the ethics ball to organize classroom activities and they assemble a team on that basis. So it's very easy to integrate the ethics ball uh, in the classroom as an activity, but it's also uh, very easy to integrate it in, um, oh, what's the name? Parascolaire, oh, sorry, sometimes I just have the word in French. Uh, extracurricular, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's very easy to, to, to do it in this way. So I believe I spent all my time. So uh, uh, there should be a document that has been in PDF that has been put in the chat. I didn't follow. It, but... Yeah, so we are gonna send everyone um, an email after the event that will have a link to all of these sort of documents that are sort of the how-to guides if you're interested in these particular programs. Nicholas, what I love about Ethics Bowl is it seems to gamify so much of what we talk about at the Morris J. Waugh Center for Dialogue. You know, how to learn from each other, how to engage, the attitudes you need. It's not just the arguments that you have. Uh, so you figured out how to turn that into a competition, uh, which, which, you know, pulls my heartstrings for sure. And in order to have an informed conversation these days, we really do have to address misinformation. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Control F and we're joined by Jessica Johnston, who is the Director of Digital Media Literacy Programming at Civics. Civics is one of the national civic education nonprofits in Canada and she leads this program. So Jessica, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And. Uh... Thank you also to Athena for sharing your experience with the program. Really appreciated that. Um, I, I'm gonna dig a fair bit into the rationale for the program uh, with this presentation, just because I think it's really important, um, as well as the nitty gritty. There are two kind of main ideas I wanna share. The first is that students struggle to evaluate information online using the skills they've been taught in school. That second part is important. The, the skills that they've been taught really, you know, don't, don't serve them in, uh, in this new digital, digital world of ours. Um, the second is that there's a better way that we can empower students with digital literacy skills that really support informed citizenship. Um, there is a problem here, but the whole, the lens is very, is very solution oriented. So I'll dig a bit more into that, but um, I do work for Civics, which is a, an organization that builds uh, civic education programming for teachers to use with their students. It's all participatory. Um, our flagship is Student Vote, which is a parallel election that runs alongside federal, provincial, and some municipal elections. And we're in nearly 80% of Canadian schools with that. This is all through building work with teachers, and it's how we kind of get our programming out there in general. Um, so in recent years, we've really uh, refined our work in, in media literacy because we know for democracy to work, people need to be informed and engaged. This is a real challenge when our information ecosystem is polluted with false and misleading information and context is often lacking. It's hard to know what to trust. Um, you know, we have this, picture, this big picture situation where, you know, everyone can be a publisher online, social media algorithms prioritize provocative content. There are people who seek to profit, whether it's financially or ideologically or both from disturbing um, content, for dis from distributing a broad range of harmful and misleading information online. So if we have, you know, this problem number one is structural and challenging to change. Problem number two has to do with how individuals process all of this information, what we actually do with it. So here we come back to this idea that students struggle to evaluate information online. Now, this isn't surprising because we all struggle with this. This is kind of everyone's problem. It can be a really daunting challenge, but today we're talking about young people and our programming is for youth. So we're talking about uh, students. Um, some real foundational research by Stanford History Education Group and others has really showed that most students flounder when asked to evaluate unfamiliar, unfamiliar sources, stories, and claims. Um, my organization is in the midst of our own large scale study that looks at what students do when asked to assess online information. Um, I'm, I've got my head in the research now, so I, I'm, you know, I have to talk about it a little bit, but we only have preliminary results. It's not final, but the picture that's emerging is pretty troubling. Um, for example, when asked to look at a website belonging to an advocacy group, only 6% of students were able to identify the presence of an agenda. So in this case, the group was the American College of Pediatricians. Um, now this was founded to advocate against the adoption of children by same-sex couples. It has been labeled by others as a hate group. Um, when asked to rate the trustworthiness of the American College of Pediatricians as a source of information about children's health, 90% of students formed their assessment by examining the site itself. Um, many indicated trust because the site is a .org instead of a .com. This one makes my head explode in particular. Anyone can buy a, can buy a .org people. That's not, doesn't make it more trustworthy. Um, other commonly cited features include the absence of ads, the professional appearance of the site, as well as the quality and the quantity of the information available. So we call these set of strategies of vertical reading. 
The common element is that students stay on the page and analyze the content itself. So in school, this type of strategy is often packaged as a checklist that students apply to evaluate credibility. The CRAP test is a common one. Um, the problem is that these strategies don't provide meaningful information and very often they backfire. So when it comes to uh, evaluating online information, we need to do something that's different. In contrast to vertical reading, um, lateral, lateral reading, ask students to leave the page where the information is, open a new tab and conduct some simple research. This is what professional fact checkers do because it's effective and efficient. Uh, these are the skills at the heart of Control F, the verification tools. Um, Control F itself is the keyboard shortcut for find. And like that shortcut, lateral reading helps us find the information we need quickly. So when we read laterally, we can gain key context quickly about a source or claim before we engage critically and give it our time and attention. Um, you know, if it's not something we want to engage with, we can find that out very quickly and just move on to the next thing and find a better source. So key, key questions in Control F will include, what are other sources saying? Has the claim been verified or disproven by a fact-checking group or professional news source? What is the reputation of the source that produced or shared this? So the Wikipedia entry for American College of Pediatricians clearly states the group's goals. With a 30 second check, you can determine what 15 minutes of close reading won't tell you. And this is just so, so important to do. Um, so the Control F program itself is for teachers um, to use with students and it packages up these, these lateral reading strategies into a series of lesson plans anchored by expert videos and interactive source evaluation assignments using real current examples drawn from both reliable and unreliable sources. So um, over the course of our research, we have had more than 3000 students go through the program um, since it launched in September. And the feedback has been really overwhelmingly positive from teachers. You know, we hear a lot about how needed these tools are and how digital media literacy is a fundamental life skill that applies kind of across curriculum. Um, so through our research study, we are also seeing some quantifiable uh, results from the program. Um, on post-test, close to half, 45% of the Control F students successfully identified the agenda of an advocacy group. Um, this time it was a climate change denial organization. And again, this is in comparison to just 6% on the pretest. So there's clearly a lot of work to be done. We can all get better at this. Um, but you know, we're really excited by the potential of lateral reading as a new standard approach to digital media literacy education and control F as a way to support informed citizenship in the classroom. Registration is free, it's available to all teachers, the materials are in French and English, and everything's available at newsliteracy.ca. You can share the, the other information, you know. After. Yeah, we'll definitely share uh, the website. Uh, when Adele uh, shared it with me, it, it blew my mind. It's a fantastic website. The curriculum is all there, it's easily accessible. Uh, so it's it's great. And now to wrap up, I hope you're all thinking about which program you wanna learn more about, because um, that's what we're gonna do after the next speakers. Uh, is so. Just before we go to those breakouts, though, let's hear a little bit more about participatory budgeting. And we're joined by Tia Crum and Sherry Davis to talk about it. Tia Crum is the Associate Director of Neighborhood Initiative at Great Cities Institute, where she has led participatory budgeting processes in Chicago since 2012. She also serves as a co-chair of the Global Participatory Budgeting Practitioners Board, which aims to improve practice and impacts. Sherry Davis is the Executive Director at the Participatory Budgeting Project, is a 2019 Obama Foundation Fellow, and helped to launch the first US instance of youth participatory budgeting in Boston, Massachusetts in 2014. Let me pass it over to the two of you to help you ex help us understand more about what participatory budgeting is. Hey everybody. And I'm super excited to be able to present one of my really good friends, Taya. Um, as, as was just mentioned, I run the participatory budgeting project in, in the United States, and I get a chance to do things like this, talk about how people together can decide how public dollars are spent and why that's important. And I'm not gonna get into any of the mechanics because Taya is gonna do that, but I did wanted to share with you quickly when it comes to, to young people, part of the reason why I wanted to be in this conversation was as we think about the first instances of PB in the United States, they've really been so connected to the power of young people. And so often we see folks like not allowed to make decisions about so many things. Budgets are a really big thing that people should be able to make decisions about because what happens after the budget decision is the things that affect you. And so young people are often excluded from that because they're not old enough. And so a lot of my work has been around reframing this idea that young people are future leaders, but instead that they're leaders right now. And so I use tools like participatory budgeting. And yes, we did some really awesome work in Boston and we've done some really exciting work across the country. And so does Taya and can give you some examples of what PB looks like for young people in schools. 
Thanks so much, Sherry. Um, I'm so excited to be here with Sherry. She's an amazing leader and has done just phenomenal work across the country. Um, just to share a little bit about um, what PB is, we talk about it and the definition that we use across North America is that it's a democratic process in which community members directly decide how to spend part of a budget. And it's an annual cycle um, where it, it follows a pretty standard process where youth, it's very youth driven, youth co collect ideas. And so Jose kind of talked about this, his group is the student voice committee, which is like a student council. So there's about 15 of them and they're collecting ideas from the whole student body, which is about 3000 people. They're gonna then take all of those ideas. They go through them, they think about what's feasible. They think about what, what's gonna be in the best interest, what's risen to the top in terms of priorities, what they've heard the most. That's the proposal development phase. So they're currently in that phase where they're really kind of doing research. They're thinking about you know, what they've heard the most from. They're going out and talking to other people. They're doing online research. Um, they're thinking about which issues are going to have the biggest impact in the school, and then they're going to put that all together on a ballot, and they're getting ready to have their vote, and they're going to have their vote when they come back in, from spring break in April, and that vote will again include the entire student body, and so everyone's voices are heard both kind of in the beginning of the process, throughout the process, it's interwoven throughout, and then at the end, they're directly deciding how to spend this money. Um, as Sherry says, and, and what we've seen in terms of the research um, on it is, is both that youth are talking about how they've seen gains in terms of collaboration, communication. Um, we've heard them talk about how they're using similar skills in around creating graphs and charts and surveys, but that the teachers talk about how they're a little bit more engaged, how they, they've got a little bit more skin in the game, a little bit more stake around it, because you know this is a project that they're gonna actually see come to fruition that's gonna have a huge impact on them and their student body. Um, and and they've, they've got some real stake in that. Um, we've heard students talk about this as their legacy in the school and how that really feels impactful to them. Um, and to give you a sense of some of the other ways in which we really think about and talk about PB is that, you know, there's always a lot of concern in the beginning when you get started about, well, what kind of projects are they really going to come up with and how is this money going to be spent? And what we've really found is that PB creates these spaces for people to hear each other a little bit differently, for them to not only unearth needs, um, in the school, but for them, for, for teachers, administrators, and students to come together to co-create and problem solve and to, to hear each other in a, in, a, in a different way. And I'll give you an example of that. In one of our schools that's in a predominantly, it's a predominantly Latinx school that's located in an area that's right next to an industrial corridor that's been the site of a lot of environmental pollution. Um, and in Chicago, and I'm sure in, in many other places, environmental justice is really intertwined with racial justice. Um, many of the locations where um, industry that is a little that is more polluting has been located in low-income communities of color. And this particular um, location has seen many violations in air pollution and soil pollution that have led to actually testing where they've found soil contamination with lead and arsenic. And so um, the students had a lot of concerns about this and they had a lot of concerns about their drinking water. And so they weren't actually using any of the water fountains in the school. Um, and the only other things that were available to them were vending machines that had soda. And sometimes they had, you know, water bottles in them, but it was both very costly as well as not very healthy. And many of the students were really interested in having water bottle um, stations that they could refill. So they could just bring, you know, a container from home, fill it up and have healthy water. Um, well, through the PB process, this was not only a project and an idea that came up and that was cited through a survey by many students, but also by teachers. The students not only then went through the process with the science department to test the water and they did find lead in it. Um, 
this became one of the projects that of course won and they were able to um, install new drinking fountains that were able to have clean water in the school. But when this was also then reported to the local school council, which helps to oversee all of the spending in the school, they were like, well, what other projects were on that ballot? And one of the other projects that was on the ballot were shower curtains. And they were like, well, wait a minute, shower curtains. What do you mean they're shower curtains? And then the story came out, well, students are chronically late after gym because they were not feeling comfortable showering in front of each other. But mm -hmm. those questions hadn't been asked until they were given the space to have these dialogues and deliberations together. So I'll, I'll end with that um, and encourage folks to come learn a little bit more about how, B, how PB creates these spaces. Fantastic, yeah, I love that it's an, an opportunity to create new conversations and new initiatives just by saying it and really, you know, basically is forcing those empowers to take a step back and actually listen in really great ways. Okay, so now is the hardest moment for the audience. It's the hardest mental task you're gonna have to do this, this afternoon, morning or evening, wherever you are. It's time to pick which program would you like to learn more about? Oh, Sherry's already pointed, like the competition is on. <laughs> on these folks. So in just a second, any minute now, there's going to be a pop-up. It's going to invite you to a breakout room to join. Each is going to be labeled according to the four programs. If you click on more, it'll, it'll, it'll show you and it will pop up if you don't see it popping up for you automatically. Just go ahead and hover over or click. I can see already people are, are going away on which one you'd like to join. And it will say join. And just click that join button. And there will be a moderator there ready to ask some questions and things like that. So go ahead and go away. We're going to come back at about at 5.23, Renee. So close us down at 5.23 so that we have a full 20 minutes. And so just click that more button. If you don't see if it's not popping up, you're going to see breakout rooms. And then it will uh, give you a room to go to. And that's where you're going to go. For anyone who's stuck and just wanting to pick a room, I see there's a few people who are unassigned. If you go to more on the bottom of your screen with those uh, selections there, you should be able to see the breakout rooms, all of them named. And if you hover over one of them, just participatory budgeting or ethics bowl, you should have an option that says join. It highlights in blue and you can click that. Uh, if not, you're welcome to use the chat and say, hey, I'd like to join. Uh, whichever room you like, and I'll assign you that way as well. So go ahead and use the chat or select it yourself.
Hello, everybody. See, we're all just piling in slowly but surely. So while um, people are piling in, um, there is definitely a lot of FOMO, a lot of fear of missing out on different breakout rooms, I'm sure. So if we wouldn't mind um, putting into the chats, telling us something that you might've learned or that you loved um, in your own breakout rooms, just so people get an idea of what was happening. While that's going, let's invite Kristen, our graphic uh, facilitator, up to share uh, her video as we just wrap up to go in and then close out the session. Okay, I will get started. Thank you so much. Um, what I'm showing you here is our first speaker um, who talked about knowledge to action. Um, and then we moved straight into our next topic, which was the ethics bowl. And we learned a lot about confidence um, and skills and different developments there through the program. Then we moved to control F and talked about info pollution. And finally to the end to talk about participatory budgeting. As you can see, all the ideas were coming pretty quickly. This is like a rapid fire kind of round. So, there's, there's a lot of content here. Um, when we got back to the ethics bowl, we learned more about how it integrates into the classroom and is across the world right now. Control F um, is about lateral reading and it can be used with teachers in the classroom to get digital media literacy. And finally, with um, participatory budgeting, there's a system that youth work through to collect ideas and identify where the money should be spent. And they develop skills and are more engaged and better at hearing each other as well. And that just kind of shows us how all the ideas kind of connect together there. Thanks so much. That's incredible. Kristen, thank you so much. You are epic. Like sir, this was definitely been the rapid fire info delivery event of the season. Um, so glad to hear so many people have been inspired and these different things. Um, Adele, do you want to sort of send your gratitude and, and and some of the things that are happening in chat and we'll wrap up here and let everyone get on with their the rest of their day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to say a major thank you to Kristen. And, and I also just want to give a major thank you to our speakers today and especially the invaluable experience, expertise offered by our students in the room. Good job, you guys. And thank you, Jen, for being such a fabulous teacher um, for my very first facilitation. And of course, our moderators, chat captains, Zoom master, closed captioning, all the support we've gotten for this event. Just thank you guys so much. And of course, to the educators and all of you attendees who we know work tirelessly to ensure our youth fulfill their grandest potential. Thank you guys so much. And Jen, close us out. Yeah, so thank you. It was exciting. Thank you for just kind of, you know, jumping around with us. We wanted to keep you all awake. We know it's the end of the day in NBC and Zoom is just, you know, melt some minds. We do want to invite you to our next conversation, which will be about climate change. So doubling down on democracy, dialogue and climate change on April 15th will be another exciting session led by folks at the center who are working in these areas. Thank you again to all four time zones who are still with us. Thank you to everyone who took something away from this event. And we do hope that you will now go have your favorite cup of hot chocolate or your favorite cocktail that's happy hour in BC and share what you learned with somebody else. To our students, thank you so much. Please brag about what you did. Please brag because you deserve it. So thank you all a warm welcome and a warm send off. Have a great, great day. And thank you for joining us from all of us at the Morris J. Wass Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. Yes, group, wait, group, group, group goodbye wave to everyone as they sign off. <laughs>